Hello again, folks. Um, today, to make up for Wednesday, um, I'm going to be doing section 6-9, uh, just not to interfere with next week, which we'll just have 6-10 uh, on Monday, and that's the last thing. Um, this is about solving quadratic equations, and the packet that I have for you today looks like this. All right, it's about, I think, seven or eight pages, something like that. This I stole from the textbook a while ago. It was a, it was a nice summary of rules of divisibility. It's not labeled as such, I'm sorry, but um, these are, that's what these are called. Well, it is actually labeled, okay. Rule, it's very faint. Rules of divisibility, all right? If you could establish a number is divisible by another number, all right? Um, the second number is a factor, all right? Right. Uh, usually it's for the sake of dividing, but of course, from the perspective of multiplication, right, that divisor is a factor. Right? So since this is going to involve factoring at some point, right, these basic rules from arithmetic are something that you want at least to have um, an inkling of. Right? Uh, I have found personally that the rule for 2, which is easy, it's, if something is even, then it's divisible by 2. And incidentally, divisible just means that it divides without a remainder. So you might say it divides nicely. Okay. Um, that means that 2 is a factor of whatever that number is. The rule for 2, the rule for 3, the rule for 6, in that order, 5 and 10 are basically the easy ones. And they're very useful to know by heart. All right. Uh, the rule for 4 in bot is a little bit more complicated, I feel, and so is 8 and 9. But um, 9 is similar to 3, 4 and 8, I want to say, are similar. Okay, the last three digits. All right, anyhow, um, those are the ones I rely on the most. 2, 3, 6, 5, and 10. All right. The real um, meat and potatoes, if you will, of this is uh, this lesson are the, uh, the methods that we employ for solving the quadratic equation. I had discussed uh, solving for linear equations, right? Linear, uh, just primarily, the basic gist of it is performing opposite operations to manipulate the terms in, and the coefficients in an equation. That is, when you move something over equals somehow, you perform opposite operations. Well, that's sufficient for linear equations, but if you up the ante for quadratics, um, we're going to be covering factoring and the zero product rule and the quadratic formula, right? The quadratic formula works for virtually everything, but it's kind of like swatting a fly with a bazooka, all right? Kind of reserve it for situations that you can't factor, you know? Um, as far as factoring is concerned, here's a more verbal uh, strategy, if you will, for factoring. All right, if you have any size polynomial, you might employ the most basic form of factoring, which is to figure the GCF, all right, and then rip it out of each of the terms. If you have a four-term uh, wide polynomial, there's a, a method called factoring by grouping. I'll show you that. Um, for a three-term wide polynomial, you tend to do these two things in tandem most often. What I would refer to as, just based upon how it looks, AC product pairs in tandem with factoring by grouping which is why it would be good to know this method also. Then there are models, all right? I'm gonna show you the overview table. This is a more symbolic uh, way of describing the same thing, all right? When you factor out a GCF, you basically write something outside of parentheses and something inside of parentheses. The thing on the outside is the common factor. Ideally, it's the greatest common factor. These things, perfect square trinomial, the difference of two squares and the sum of the difference of two cubes are models. If the, the polynomial that you are working with resembles those, right, then you might try to factor according to these models. That's something that you memorize, basically. Um, this is a page in regard to factoring a radical, which if you employ quadratic formula, <clears throat> you may have to use. And just not to leave you without um, some basic information, here's a reference for um, the square root of numbers that happen to be perfect squares. 
All right, famously won for 9, 16, 25 of perfect squares, which means that they produce a whole number, basically, for an outcome. Um, they literally refer to a square, right? The dimensions of uh, a 25 uh, square uh, would be a, a dimension of 5 on one side and 5 on another side, whatever the unit is. Okay. And then there's a word problem, which we'll get to. So um, do try to print this out, all right? Especially this, I, I, I feel the uh, this old set of rules people tend to be rusty on. All right, so it's good to have a reference for divisibility. There's a lot of stuff in math that you end up in the long run need to memorize. All right? It makes you more strategic. That's the real advantage to it. When, when you see something that's familiar, you go, hmm, you know, maybe I'll go this way rather than that way in addressing it. All right. So let's get busy. I'm very breathy this morning. I don't know why. It's from hunching. You know? I really want to stand up, but I can't. <laughs> I was wondering if my camera is sinking here. Jeez, I hope not. Uh, let me just check the legs here. Make sure that it's not getting lower, as that would be very cool. Sorry to make you dizzy. This tripod is not the best, but it works. Okay, it's pretty much right where it has to be. All right, uh, it's a bit gray today, and I'm, I'm sort of gray too. Uh, so I'm gonna put the overhead light on. That'll help, I think, a bit. It's only it's 11 o'clock in the morning, but it, it seems like it's late at night. All right, anyhow, <clears throat> back to work. Ooh, this is wet. I gotta get a paper towel. And I'll be right back. <coughs> Ooh, I wonder if this one. No, that's fine. I'll leave that there. Ready? Okay. Um, let me give you an overview of um, solving equations. Right? You're not responsible for all of this, but it's nice to be able to place the thing that you are responsible in the big picture. So the name of the section is specifically solving quadratic equations. So that's really what you're responsible for. But um, and it's still a good reference to know where in the universe you are in terms of math. Let's see. Hope that dries out. We'll see. All right. Um, here are some types of equations and how you might go about solving them. All right. The types of equations that um, Math 114 is responsible for are referred to collectively as poly they're polynomial based. Right? They themselves are not polynomial equations, you know, I suppose. They're based upon a polynomial, would be more accurate. Right? What does that mean? It means that the, the building blocks, the chunks, are polynomials, which basically means something that looks like this plus or minus. It could just be uh, one term equals and then something on the opposite side. But this is the basic chunk that is a polynomial. There are some criteria here that have to be met to qualify as a polynomial. I'll tell you. Uh, first of all, the coefficient up in the front has to be real. Um, and if you, That's kind of vague. What is something that's real? Anything that's not imaginary. <laughs> what does it mean to be imaginary? Imaginary uh, would be like the square root of a negative. All right. 
So as long as you don't see a square root, you just see some uh, the negative specifically, but some other ordinary number that is real. Right? You could assume virtually anything else except square roots of negatives are real. Uh, as for the exponent, and this is really what makes it linear or quadratic or, or something else. The exponent has to be non-negative. Non-negative is uh, uh, implying two things uh, simultaneously. If something is non-negative, it means that it is not negative. But what are the things that are not negative? zero or the positives right. and they have to be technically an integer right. so it will have a sign you know you might say just for the sake of simplicity either the number zero or a positive whole number would be sitting here that qualifies as non-negative right. now what you had seen memory serves me, are the linear type of equations. Right. Uh, and the linear type are basically something, if it's an equation, first of all, it has an equal sign. But the, uh, the telltale uh, sign that you have a linear type of equation is that you are degree one which means, and that's unfortunate because, you know, that when it comes to ones, they're optional, right? Very often when it comes to a degree one, they will not bother to write a one, right? Um, in math, often ones are just taken for granted, zeros, decimal points, and positive signs. And I don't feel that there's anything wrong with including those things, but it's left out more for aesthetic than anything else. It kind of looks nice if it's less complicated, right? Anyhow. These are referred to as degree one because of the exponent being no worse than a, a one, right? And it's part of an equation, so it has to have an equal sign. So look for those two things. You know you're dealing with an equation if you see an equals, and you know that you're dealing with a linear equation specifically if you see a one or something that's not there. Then you can fill it in, all right? What we're gonna be doing now are dealing with quadratics. And all that they do is up the ante. So instead of it being just uh, exponent of 1, it will be exponent of 2. No worse than a 2. Right? These would be referred to as degree 2 equations, alternatively. Right? I just thought, the second of uh, again, positioning this into a larger picture. You're not responsible for these other things, really. Um, there are other types of equations. So there's a little void in here. Uh, there are famously rational equations. And then there are radical equations. We will deal with radicals because we have the quadratic formula, which has a radical embedded in it. Um, but it's not, it's not a radical equation because the variable will not be in it. Right? We're going to evaluate it. The last type would be absolute value. And no, I am not a drinker. Uh, I always laugh at that, but think of absolute vodka, right? Absolute vodka, absolute value, right? You know, if, you, if you do too much math, you might want to get drunk quicker, right? Um, don't set a bad example for the kids now, right? That's not cool, right? Hiccup, all right? Uh, as far as the, um, the similarities and the differences, all right, in the, the uh, telltale feature, if you will, these would have a negative exponent, right? If polynomials are restricted to either a positive is usually the case or technically zero to be non-negative, right? Then a rational-based um, equation 
can, you know, um, what's the word? Uh, diverge from that. Right? So this, these are basically negative integers. And the key phrase there really is, aside from negative, integer, all right? which is implying whole, all right? a whole number sitting here that happens to be negative. All right? You might say, well, why don't you just write that? Because there's another type here. The radicals, <clears throat> when you have a, a fraction as the exponent, all right, they uh, would basically be an abbreviation for what qualifies as a radical equation. Um, not to digress too much, but if you saw something like this, x to one half, it can stylistically be written like this instead. Nobody bothers to put a two for a square root, but that's what a half really is. When you have a half for an exponent, it really is referring to a square root, right? And again, for the same reason, you know, nobody bothers to write a one really. They can, and I feel that they should for the sake of clarity. But uh, these features would be seated here, uh, seated here and here, right, in theory. Right. Absolute value would be to have that box you've probably seen. This is referred to as the modulus symbol. Um, an absolute value is to distance from zero. Anyhow, these are more complicated type of uh, equations and they will require specific techniques. You in uh, Mat 114 are not really responsible for these. I'm only mentioning them because it helps you go, oh, this is part of a bigger picture. And right. uh, just changing this one little feature here, the number over the sign, all right, or in theory, the uh, type of number, all right, um, it changes the type of equation that you're dealing with. And once you, you get comfortable recognizing that, then you strategically go, aha, I should go this, follow this set of rules versus perhaps another, all right? It's uh, for the sake of strategy. Now, just to remind you, what's the basic uh, technique that you learn from uh, working with linear equations? That in order to solve them, Right, without any preliminary simplification, you manipulate them via opposite operations. This is usually, especially if it's the first time that a student sees algebra, they get a little frustrated, right, because they go, wait a minute, it says plus, why shouldn't I be adding? You just took six years of my life and you told me that I had an add when I saw that symbol. That's true. Right, and it's still true, right? If you're sticking with one side of equals, right? If you want to move over equals for the sake of solving an equation, you perform the opposite operation, right? Similarly, if you see multiplication, which is often just, it's just implied, I haven't even bothered drawing the dot half the time, you end up performing division, right? This basic technique of performing opposite operations and doing it to uh, both sides for the sake of balance, both sides, is um, going to be revisited no matter what uh, incarnation of an equation you're working with. All right, that will never go away. That's the one thing about math I think that everybody would agree is good, right? That it's founded on something that's rock solid, all right? It'll never change, right? While quadratics will require uh, more sophisticated techniques, right, which again is why I have this handout to summarize them. I made this, right? And it looks ugly, perhaps it's a little complicated, all right? But you're really only responsible for the one here, factoring in zero product rule, and the one here, which I think most people probably lean on just because it's ah, formula, just get this done and move on with my life. And I don't blame you, really. Um, what we'll be talking about today is this, right? The, the slightly more sophisticated techniques that involve factoring, 
uh, with the zero product rule. and the quadratic formula. Right. And that's it, all right? Um, I, I don't know how long the video will be, all right? But uh, we're really just gonna be covering these two things. Factoring, I wanna make sure that it's clear though. I mean, like, if a person is comfortable with factoring, you get that done pretty lickety split. But uh, if you're a little sketchy about it, we'll try to fix that. Okay, so there's a good overview of where we are in the bigger picture. All right, and now I have to destroy this <laughs> because um, I need the space. I wet my eraser so it's a little bit more functional. Even gets rid of my blue face to about that. But I do need to wipe it dry. Um, let me uh, just make sure that some terminology is clear. I do believe I, I mentioned this at one point, but um, since we're working with quadratics, we are therefore working with polynomial building blocks. So this is to remind you, polynomials uh, can come in one of three flavors at least. We have the monomial type. the binomial type and the trinomial type. Okay. Um, basically, this is an example of a monomial. All right. It could be less complicated than that. It could just be a digit technically. It could be five, you know, and it would still qualify as a monomial at least from the perspective of calculus. Um, anyhow, here's an example of a binomial, and here's an example of a trinomial. I am purposely writing these things, that should be a number, let's go with two. I am purposely writing these in parentheses, even though they probably won't show up that way in a textbook. Uh, but the reason that I'm doing that is because I want you to get in the habit of thinking about these things as being isolated. You know, like, this is a, a good, a nice little isolated chunk of math goodness. You know, a chocolate chip, if you will, all right? Or you could have something that is separated by a plus or a minus, all right? In which case, now you have two chunks, all right, that are unified, all right? Even though uh, they might seem like two autonomous things, if you group them like this, Right, they would be referred to as a binomial. Okay, similarly, if you grouped these three things together, separated by pluses or minuses, you could refer to them as a trinomial. The logic is that, well, the nomenclature is similar to that with things with wheels, right? Um, a bicycle has two wheels, this has two terms. A tricycle has three wheels, this has three terms. Beyond three, I mean, they don't specify uh, a label. They might just say a four-term polynomial. All right? It would make total sense to go, oh, it's a quadrinomial, but that word doesn't exist. Perhaps you could trademark that. <laughs> I should, why am I giving you advice? I should do that. Um, mono uh, as in, you know, one as well. Um, <clears throat> Anyhow, polynomial, you can think of as being a more general phrase, and each of these are more specific, okay? All of these are, in fact, polynomials. They're just a specific type of polynomial, okay? And be able to recognize them by their width, basically. Width, width, width. That's what I'm talking funny. Funnier. Let's see. All right. Um,
before we get to factoring, let's do the opposite of factoring. Builds a frame of reference, right? Um, basically, when we get into the subject of factoring, right, we can think of factoring as basically dividing without consciously being aware of it. It is, this, and the reason I say that is because. Um, if you take something that is, a, say, a trinomial and you factor it into two binomials, they'll be separated by a multiplication dot or just in parentheses, right? It is no balls to do the work. Anyhow, when you get it to that point, some kind of division happens somewhere, right? And if it were part of a rational expression, right, a lot of times you would cross out similar looking factors above and below the uh, fraction line. Like, for example, if you had something like this. and you cross these out, that's dividing without really consciously thinking about it. Right? You fact it for that purpose, perhaps. You're not going to see this, right? but um, if you've ever taken algebra 2, you might go, oh, geez, that looks familiar. And, you know, factoring is really dividing without consciously thinking about it. So, let's start with the multiplication. Right? The opposite of division is multiplication. So, um, you've probably seen types of problems like this. And even without giving you a verbal instruction, I'll bet that you intuitively know what to do. And if you don't, we'll make sure that you do. Okay? Think back to high school, right? And then you saw a nice little packet of good math goodness again sitting next to a second one. And they are... Uh, partitions here in their own little parentheses, right? A binomial, by definition, sitting next to a binomial. Right. What does your instinct tell you to do? It might tell you to do this, right? If you're going to multiply this first term by each of these, and then immediately after, multiply this second term by each of these. If that's your instinct, cool. All right. What that means is that multiplying binomials is essentially the distributive, pop, uh, distributive property twice. Right. You know when you have uh, a less sophisticated problem like this, 2 times x plus 3, right? that if you can't merge together the, the components of the parentheses, maybe what you can accomplish is that you could get the parentheses to go away. How do you do that? The distributive property. The distributive property says you can multiply the outside thing by each of the inside things, right? in which case you would get 2x plus 6. Well, when you see a binomial sitting next to a second binomial, they really should give you a specific instruction to do something, but you probably intuitively go, ah, I'm going to have this little range war that I have going on here. 2x times x, 2x times 3. Negative 1 times x, negative 1 times 3. Right. Let's write that out. If we did the work involved, <coughs> 2x times x, is 2x, and then you add these, I should mention, add exponents when you multiply bases. That is, they should be like bases. That's known as the product rule of exponents. 2 times 1, that's the coefficient times the coefficient, and x times x would be x squared. Okay? 
if you now uh, apply this to the three, right? The coefficient times the coefficient. Perhaps I will write that just for reference. doesn't dry fast enough sometimes. Basically, the coefficient times the coefficient, and then the letter, uh, the letter times the letter. In which case you, uh, as long as it is same, right, you, add the exponents. This is referred to as the product rule of exponents. If you wanted to be official, anyhow. Two times three would give you six. You should consider the sign simultaneously. Why are you being so difficult? I'm gonna have to get a new black. Hold on a second. I have a stiff talking to. I can't guarantee that these are going to work. And I shouldn't get bogged down, but uh, I have two others here. So you are replaceable. Don't ever forget it. Okay. Let's see if that works. Hey, cool. All right, great. Uh, do some hard time here in the cup, <laughs> and hopefully that will be okay. All right, so back to work here. Two times three is indeed six. This is a positive two, and this is a positive three, so it's a positive six. All right. And then since this is just x, it maintains just that letter, and that status is being degree one. Um, when you deal with the green, right, it's the same process. It's the distributive property, twice, literally. Negative one times positive one, because that technically is a positive one for the coefficient, is a minus one. And very difficulties. And then there's an x there, so you have an x. And then negative one times positive three is negative three. So one's things still. Okay. okay. This is the effect of doing multiplication. Right. So if you're asked at some point to uh, basically multiply binomials, you're just using the distributive property, distributive property. What you should do is combine like terms. Hopefully this is not too faint. Let me just check if it's in the frame. Looks like it is. Um, all right. Also, remember, you add or subtract like terms normally. So these two things that are in the middle, red is the most reliable, would be combined. All right. So if you have one of these as a positive and one of these as a negative, you actually subtract. You establish the digit of five with an x attached to it. You take the sign of the bigger one, so this is a positive five, right? And anything else that was there is just sitting around it, right? And this is the end result. 2x squared plus 5x minus 3. I bet this is probably old hat to you, all right? And if not, don't feel bad, all right? You, in time, will have enough experience with it. It's just distributed property done twice. Um, <clears throat> um, let me, what else to say? Okay. I want to make sure that this process is basically clear, all right, before we do the opposite of multiplying, which is namely dividing, which is really factoring. Okay? Factoring is dividing without really thinking about it. Okay. Um, let me show you something that's kind of neat. And I'm not going to use my eraser because I don't really want to make a mess. Now, it gets the job done, that's the problem. I want to show you something. 
the same problem, but done just stylistically different. I hope there's no soap in it. Maybe that's why. I'm blaming my poor Marco when in fact it's just me. I created the problem here. It's soap. Well, I better be a good guy and dry this good guy. Um, this is also something that you're not really responsible for, but it's an alternative way of accomplishing the same task. Uh, I worked with a lady in Staten Island once um, who imparted to me um, something that someone else had taught her who was a biology teacher. Right. I thought this was neat. In the subject of biology, specifically, uh, when they teach you about genetics, right? Uh, this subject comes up a lot. Pune squares, which is to predict the you know the uh, the traits of uh, you know say pea planes or say something like that, you know. And they would draw a box that looks like this. Right? And they would put the genetic traits of. Uh, the mother along the top here, and the genetic traits of the father, perhaps, along the side here, and then blend them together. So, like, for example, if you had, it was, um, in my own life, it was the subject of brown eyes versus blue eyes. So, uh, <clears throat> let's say that you have two parents that have brown eyes, um, but they're carrying the recessive trait for blue eyes, which is what this lower case is. Brown is a dominant trait. Most people have brown eyes. The genetic mutation that is uh, blue eyes is a lower case B. Right. So then you would cross these and you would write them in the boxes like so. And this isn't going to guarantee that you're gonna have children in exactly this way. But what it means is that one out of four may have the genetic mutation that is exclusively blue eyes. So they will have blue eyes. You know? well, how does that affect us? Well, what I'm getting at is that if we were going to apply this to math, and this is what uh, the lady I worked with had suggested. Again, she uh, had been informed of this uh, by a biology instructor at one point. She herself taught math. If you took the original um, problem, which was 2x minus 1 and x plus 3, and treated them as if they were the mother, you know, and wrote those characteristics up here, and they were the father, you know, of this polynomial here, this trinomial, you could basically do the same thing. Uh, that's kind of cool, I thought. I wish I had a purple, because I would put the purple in here, but I don't have that kind of a marker. So, uh, for the sake of contrast, I'll just try to use green. 2x times x is 2x squared. x times negative 1 is negative 1x. 2x times 3 is positive, and I would include the signs, always. Uh, 6x, and 3 times negative 1 is negative 3. You get all of the same features that are written in black here. Right. And kind of cool thing is that the things that are diagonal are the things that you combine because they like terms. So you would end up with the exact same answer. The things that are not going to be combined with anything because they don't have a friend, a buddy here. 2x squared and minus 3. And the two things that can be combined because they are like terms, which would be positive 5x. It's just an alternative way of accomplishing the same thing. This uh, process, which involves distributed property twice, has a name. When you basically engage, I'm just trying to avoid my eraser for a moment. When you engage in this process, 
but multiplying this times this, and then this times this. This is referred to usually as FOIL method, right? versus what I'm describing here, which, you know, it's from biology, really. You might call the Punay square method. To coin a phrase. It's just a kind of cool thing that I thought. I never forgot that, you know. So I, I had been taught about you know genetics when I was in maybe maybe in eighth grade, you know. And they did and they applied this to you know um, figuring out probabilities for again brown eyes versus blue eyes or how tall a pea plant is or how short it is. Well, the color of the pea plant, all right. But all right, taking that and you know superimposing it upon math. Suddenly, it made it more valuable to me. Not that genetics isn't valuable, you know. You found a hook, basically, and that, as a teacher, not to digress again, but when you're a teacher, the hard part is selling whatever it is that you're talking about, right? To get somebody to listen to you, right? To get somebody to trust you that you're going to help them, you know. Anyhow, FOIL method is an acronym for first. That's these two things, first times first, outside, outsides, I really should pluralize these, which is now from the perspective of 2x being on the outside here and 3 on the outside here, insides, which is these two, they are inside here, inside here, and then you change the, per the perspective to being, this is the last one of this one, this is the last one of this one, lasts, all right? You could remember this acronym, and go through the process. I never really thought about it that way. I just, to me, it's like, it's distributed property, all right? So if this wasn't here, I would just intuitively do that. If this wasn't here, I would just intuitively do that, all right? But this is what they usually tell you in a textbook foil, all right? Either way, as you can see, it accomplishes the same thing. I think I had better keep my markers um, not on my ledge, unfortunately, because they seem to be getting dried out really quick. So you're, you're going to see me getting frustrated for the next, uh, you know, hour or whatever long time it is. I'm going to be doing this a lot, you know, picking things up out of my cup, you know. Let me get another paper towel. works very well, but it takes time. I, try, I really should be more conscientious. I don't want to leave soap on my board because then I'll screw up my markets. And then I'm in trouble. If I can't write, how will you illustrate? Not as effectively. Hopefully that's good and dry. It's a lose-lose situation. I'm going to get in the soap on the board, cleaning effectively, or spraying alcohol and getting dizzy from it. <laughs> uh, now, let me refer to the packet again. All right. The reason that we're going through this conversation about factoring at all, all right, is because the method that you are responsible for, and I should probably just sort of Put a little asterisk here. I'll bleed through the paper. All right. Is factoring and the zero product rule in tandem for the sake of solving quadratics? Right. So we really need to understand factoring pretty clearly in order to employ this method. All right. How do you factor? Again, it's good to know terminology, and you could look at this is a more verbal way of of giving you a strategy. It's more vague only because there's no visual aid, all right? There's no uh, sort of how the thing looks. That's why I drew this as well, all right? When we employ this most basic method of factoring, and I'll do that now, this is how you want to make something look. There's something sitting outside of the parentheses and something sitting inside of the parentheses. 
So let's start with that. This is more factoring. It's a bit faint. If you had the expression 4x minus 8, you should always try to employ of all the choices, all the methods of factoring, um, the most basic technique. And the most basic technique, again, is to figure out something that is in common amongst the terms and put that outside of the parentheses and then figure out what the, uh, the simplified remains would be. So we might call them the leftovers. Would you like to be a leftover? Yeah. In common, the thing in common ideally is going to be a greatest common factor. It also will technically be a monomial because it's going to be one term wide. Figuring out what the greatest common factor is is a little bit difficult if you're a little sketchy about um, uh, multiplication tables, right? If there's a reason, and I want to corrupt your opinion when I say this, if there's a reason why you should press upon your your superiors, all right, or anyone in a position of authority, all right, and your students and their parents, um, the necessity of memorization, all right, of fundamental facts, all right, it's for this purpose, right? And they may scoff at that and go, I don't care about algebra, all right. If you memorize, when you're a kid who's eight years old and you're going into elementary education, that 114 people, if you're dealing with a kid who's eight years old, they're not a genius yet, all right? You gotta help them get there. So teach them the most fundamental technique for learning, which is to memorize some facts about things. When they get into middle school and older, they could be a little bit more analytical and you help them when you get there too, all right? It's not that we have one thing in lieu of another. All right, but in the past 20 years in the United States, the mistake that we have made is we go, ah, don't make them memorize things, why? Because they have a calculator, right? If you don't memorize things, you lose the, um, the strategy of making prediction, right? And the comfort that comes from the familiar. So, for GCF, here's a strategy for you. Greatest common Factor, and incidentally, factors are different uh, from multiples. People often confuse these two things because they both a number can have both a factor and and could also have a multiple, and they might be the same digit. As a matter of fact, they both involve multiplication somehow. But here's the difference: factors make products right. versus this is a crummy one too go up there right. multiples are products that's the difference the operative term is make or they are okay so for example if you were to list um, the factors of 12, all right, I'm going to do it in pairs because it might be a little bit more easy to read. It's 1 times 12, all right, it's 2 times 6, it's 3 times 4. These things in tandem, these pairs of factors, 1 and 12, 2 and 6, and 3 and 4 respectively, make the number here. Yes, 12 is a factor of itself. It sounds silly to say that, but it's true. Simultaneously, you could list the multiples of 12. Right? They are the products of 12, the thing that maybe you should make a kid memorize, you know? Uh, is the board really that greasy? 12. 12 times 1. 12 times 2. 12 times 3. 12 times 4. 12 times 5. And you can't memorize everything. The old standard in the United States, at least, up until probably the 80s, I would say, 
is that um, you would memorize up to from one times one up to twelve times twelve. Like if you ever have had um, a marble notebook, what you see in the inside of the marble notebook is usually a little table that is a multiplication table, so along with other things about you know uh, unit conversion. Anyhow, twelve times twelve is one hundred forty-four. Why do I know? Because I memorized it, right? Why would that be to my advantage in algebra? Because then I won't go struggling to figure out what has to factor here and here. In other words, if you have a firm grasp of multiplication, you will not suffer when you do division, which is its polar opposite operation. All right? So don't hobble the kid, help them. All right? Encourage them to have that most fundamental uh, method. All right, for, for learning, all right, which is to, to memorize some fundamental facts. Okay, you see that distinction. If we're looking for a GCF for this purpose, right. um, there's two parts that we'll have to worry about: the number and the letter, respectively. When you're dealing with the number, this is a more sophisticated technique, but the brute force uh, uh, to the method would work. You could list and compare. What do I mean by list? If you have more than one number, list the factors of the first and of the second, and then look for the biggest number that is in common. When you're dealing with the letter, there's a much simpler thing. Right? It's going to be, somewhat ironically, the lowest power of the letter in common. If you have something more complicated than, uh, you know, just a monomial, you apply that to the same thing, to a binomial. If you have like the similar looking binomials, look at their degree. They would have to be written. You're not going to have that type of a problem realistically in this class. All right, but remember that. The lowest power of the letter in common. All right. So, of these numbers, four and eight, I'll do it brute force because it, it's the fastest thing to do, really. All right, the numbers that four are made of, right, are one, two, and four. And I know that; I memorized it. You know, what are the numbers that eight are made of? It would be one and eight and two and four. I'm going to put them in order. All right, everything is made of the fact of one. But you ideally want the greatest common factor. So what's the greatest common factor in this particular case? For itself is the GCF. Therefore, 4 would be sitting here. It's not just in common. It's the greatest thing in common. And it's a monomial because it's one term wide. As for the letter, you see that they don't have a letter in common. This has an X that doesn't. So you can't put the letter X here. All right. Now here's where division comes in handy. All right. And this is why the opposite of uh, multiplication division is what factoring really is. What is it times 4 that gives you 4X? If the letter, pardon me, the letter. <laughs> this is my mind. If the number 4 is already established here, right, the only thing that you need to include in this space is X. What is it times 4 that gives you negative 8? Now, if you know the factors already, you probably have some inkling, but it would be minus 2. Right. Factoring is dividing without really consciously thinking about it. Why? Because you're kind of thinking about it from the perspective of multiplication. Right. Anyhow, that would be the answer. Right. What is this 4x minus 8 factored? It would be 4 sitting on the outside of a parentheses. And 2x, pardon me, x minus 2 left behind on the inside of a parenthesis. Right? And that's really what the objective is when we get to solving. We need, if we're going to go that method for solving, we need to know how to factor, at least in this most basic way. Something a little bit more complicated. Here's another one. You probably 
know, have seen in your life, uh, if you can still factor in here for practice, that's a much better walker. This one, that's kind of crummy, so I'm going to put that here. Factor um, x squared plus 6x plus 8. If you have an intuition that tells you, uh -huh, this is probably going to factor like this, plus or minus, plus or minus, good. Right? If you have that intuition when you see something that's not too complicated, a trinomial to be uh, precise, right, usually factors. like so, into a binomial sitting next to a binomial. And I would agree that if, if it's not too complicated, if it's just x at the front, all right, then you probably could just tinker with it and figure out what these four voids are. All right? If you feel, if you have that, intui that intuition already, God bless you, all right, all right, don't fight that, that's a good thing. All right? In fact, I'll do it really quickly. But then I'm going to show you a more sophisticated method that works virtually 100% of the time that you would need for something more complicated. Okay? You could reason to yourself, well, if it's x squared, it's probably going to be an x in the front here and an x in the front here. And if I consider again the factors of 8 or 2, 1, 2, 4, and 8, all right? And maybe it would be more ideal to sort of write them stacked one and eight or two and four. All right. I'm going to choose either that option or that option uh, based upon the number in the middle here. All right. Which of these two choices, one and eight or two and four, would probably make six if maybe you added, maybe you subtracted, would be two and four. Right. And that's why you would put that here and here. Right. And then you would have to, I always check the signs as an afterthought. Right. Um, what causes these things to add? Right. They would have to be same signs causes basically adding. For lack of, lack of a more eloquent expression, causes adding. Right. So plus four, that's not like mold the bartender now. <laughs> It's called the flaming mo, all right? All right, plus four plus two would make plus six, right? You could distribute it to prove that this is true, all right? I, I hate to, you know, beat a dead horse, but you know, I, I, you really shouldn't take things on faith in math, right? You should do the work, all right? X times X is X squared. X times four is positive four X. Two times X is plus two X. And two times four is eight. Right. And these things in the middle produce the six that was there. So it's, everything is copacetic. Right. Anyhow, again, if you can go directly from this to what is usually the case, trinomials usually factor as a binomial times a binomial, good. All right. Don't fight the intuition, it's a blessing. All right. the same thing when you're in the position of a teacher. Don't squash a kid. If they have an intuition about doing something, it isn't necessarily the best way to do it, but don't take that away from them. All right, just give them the alternative. All right, now, here's the slightly more complicated way of doing this problem, which I'm only gonna show you because you know what the answer is already. And it's gonna be useful in the long run. I'm desperately trying not to erase that. I will refer to this sheet. All right. Basically, what I have described so far is just this, the GCF method. The method that you should always try first until it fails. When it fails, move on to more sophisticated methods, but always attempt to do this first. 
What I want to talk about now is this method here. AC, I call it this. I've never seen the textbook actually say it. This is what it's called. All right, I'm calling it by the way it looks. All right, AC product pairs in tandem with factoring by grouping. You see this little model here, A, AX uh, squared plus BX plus C. That's a trinomial. The thing that we just did right, was a trinomial. I'm gonna put it back here. X squared plus six X plus eight. In my mind, if I have this model as a reference, AX squared plus BX plus C. Look what is sitting in the unique problem in the position of A and in the position of C. Get in that habit. In this case, and this is the reason why you wouldn't bother doing it this method, there is no coefficient that's written here. You would assume it is one, right? And I'm gonna go through the, walk through the mechanics of this anyway. One would be sitting in the position of A for this problem, and eight would be sitting in the position of C in this problem. If you take these two things and then multiply them, they form an AC product in a very literal way. Right? One times eight is in fact that product. And from that product, you can list pairs of factors, as I had been doing. I just sort of wrote them above the eight before because it was convenient to do so. Let's say that you took a little bit of extra paper and wrote them over here. One, eight, and then two and four. All right, again, if a person has that fundamental, those fundamental facts down pat in their mind, or at least have a reference to look for, all right, it will make you a little bit more strategic when you're in the process of factoring here. You would establish that it's one times eight that makes eight, and two times four that makes eight also, all right? And that means you have choice number one or choice number two when you're trying to deal with this, all right? That's AC product pairs and uh, uh, portion of this technique. The other thing is factoring by grouping. Factoring by grouping is a little uh, ironic, perhaps, because what you end up doing is you take the middle term here and you split it into either a sum or a difference. And the stuff that is written uh, adjacent up here, I'm just going to carry it down and draw it here and here. Right? This is the positive eight, this is the positive eight. The sign here and here need to be figured out. All right. But you create these two voids. All right? You take the thing and you split it into either a sum or a difference. All right? Don't worry about the signs yet. All right. Worry about how you would establish the digit. All right. How do you establish the digit? From the, one of these two choices. It's either going to be via adding or via subtracting. And this part you could probably do in your head. All right. If you added 1 and 8, would you get 6? No. If you subtracted 1 and 8, you'd get 7, which is too much. So you would logically rule that out. But you'd have to have the list in order to choose from. 2 and 4, if you added them, would you get 6? You know already, that's true. If you subtract them, you get 2, that would be too short. So, we're going to have um, perhaps the 4 here and the 2 here. And since they have to have an X attached to it, we'll include that as well. Now, as for the signs, I always, again, I do this as an afterthought, right? Which operation? Adding or subtracting makes something bigger. You have a four here and you have a two here and they are going to change into a six in theory. What causes them to get that obviously bigger than them? 
the process of adding. The second thing that you think about is what combination of signs, same signs or one of each, causes adding. Same signs causes adding. I know that's not too elegant to say it that way, but it's true, right? Whether they're both negative or they're both positive, if they're the same, they cause things to get bigger. They cause adding, basically. So a negative and a negative is a bigger negative when you add them, right? So that means that since they're both the same sign, there would be a plus here and a plus here. Okay? Now here's the part that usually gets people mad at me, right? Uh, the first time that I mention this. They go, all right, buddy, you just took this thing that I could have done in two seconds. And we already did. We already know what the answer is. All right. And you made it uglier than it was. And I'm with you on that. That's true. All right. You took a three-term wide polynomial and you made it a four-term wide polynomial. So superficially, at least, it would seem, wow, you have nothing to do with your life, do you? <laughs> but here's the thing. The irony is, when you're trying to factor, which hasn't really come yet, all right, we're still set preliminary work here, which I'm taking my time about purposely. When you are, when you have a four-term wide polynomial, the irony of the situation is that it's easier than a three-term wide polynomial. That is to say, uh, there's no quadrinomials, but that thing, four terms is easier to factor than a trinomial because you actually only need to pay attention to two things at once rather than three things at once. That's the whole point of this. So, and when you have a harder problem, you would want to have an established technique. So I'm going to erase this just because I need this fixed and I'll continue. There. Now here's what you do. Maybe draw a little line like this and narrow your focus to just these two things at once. What ends up happening, as is often the case in math, is that once you have gotten it down to what you you've decided what you're going to factor, right? you revert back to the earlier technique. The earlier technique of trying to find out what is in common and writing it outside of parentheses and what is left over on the inside of the parentheses. But just paying attention to these two things rather than three things at once. All right, so these have a common letter, all right? When it comes to deciding the GCF, all right, of x squared versus x to the first, technically, you want the lower power of the letter in common. It has to be in common for GCFs, all right? So, it would, in fact, be an x, but which one should I choose, x squared or x1? x1 is really what I have to do. As for a number, technically it would be a 1, but nobody bothers to write that. So we have established what the outside is. I'm going to, for the sake of simplicity, just write that much for right now. Now you say to yourself, x times what would be x squared? It would take an additional x to the first. Because when you multiply letters, x to the first times x to the first, you add these, and you get x2. Right? x times what would make 4x. The letter is already accounted for on the outside. What do I have to include here? Plus 4. Okay? And that's the more concise way of writing it. Okay. Then there's this. Shift your focus over to here. I'll put this in red just for the sake of contrast. Um, you're going to go through the earlier technique again. We're going to figure out uh, what is in common on the outside. Ideally, it's the GCF. And then what the leftovers would be on the inside. Um, I would do one other thing too. If there's a plus here and you're certain that that's what it is, start with that. Put the plus here. All right. If you examine these two features, 2 and 8, um, they, um, 
they two expose they don't have a letter in common so you would really get stuck with if you're going to do it the brute force way listing one and two and then one two four and eight all right the factors of these two things respectively and then choose what the greatest one is everything is made of one and you could always get away with putting a one here but you want the greatest common factor so in this case it's two you would put a two here and that's established as a gcf now you work it backwards. Two times what would be two x. Two x, all right. Two times what would be eight plus four. Right. Now, here's the payoff, all right, for your trouble for doing this. When going through this process. When what you get on the inside here in blue exactly matches what you got in the inside in here in red, that makes it factor like this. The match gets its own parentheses. And even though I know that there's two of them, you only have to write it once. And then, this is not a technical term, but what I refer to as the left outs, they get their own parentheses, right? These are your binomial factors from before, which you can verify that this will be the correct answer, having done it the more simplistic way. Okay. What is the... Um, the exact match. I'm going to just put it in blue. X plus four. Right. What other things, when I refer to this other thing as the left outs, again, no book will call it that. That's just personally what I call it for the literal reason. These are on the left of these, and they're on the outside, so they're left out, right? X plus two. These are the factors. X plus four, X plus two. All right. This process that you see here, this step that is basically from here to here, that is very faint. Alright, this one is a little dud. It's on its way out. This is the process of factoring by grouping. It's for the situation when you have a four-term-wide polynomial that you do that usually. All right. This is AC product pairs. Working these two things in tandem, right, is powerful. All right. When I have to factor something, this, at least when it's something more complicated than this example, I do this all the time. All right. These two things in tandem with one another. All right. Because even if you don't have all right, uh, perfect square trinomial, which is a model, memorized, you could still get the answer, all right? And this is, again is the answer, all right? X plus four, X plus two, all right? Again, you might be a little frustrated and go, gee, Ziggler, all right, you took a half an hour to explain something, shame on you. When you're in the position of teacher, you must be very precise, right? I fail sometimes in my effort to do that, all right? But that's still the goal. All right. It is better to over-explain something, however long it takes, than to under-explain something. You give your student comfort that way, and comfort leads to confidence. I promise now that that is established, that I'll do one more uh, just factoring and nothing else, and I'll do it more efficiently. It's funny how that is. But the minutia needs to be down pat, otherwise you hobble somebody.
That's one of these types, and I swear that I'll stop. Okay. This is still just factoring. Try not to write on myself. I think I succeeded. Good. Okay. I'm not doing that. Uh, I may have broken my marker, but. Okay. There you go. 6x squared minus 11x minus 10. Right. Put the work over here. If somebody said factor this, it's probably not impossible. It's probably not impossible to go directly from what is given to you to the factored form. And then to tinker with these four terms and then establish what their signs are right after the fact. It's probably not impossible to do that, but it would be arduous. All right. So to have the more sophisticated method on hand for this type of a problem, when you see that there's a number up in the front, all right, rather than just the imaginary one floating there, you know, the abstract one, I should say. Rather than do that, rather than sit there and experiment over and over again, kind of blindly feeling around in the dark, all right, let's do it the other way. All right, we have a model. All right. AX squared plus BX plus C. This is sitting in the position of A. This is sitting in the position of C. Don't worry about the signs. Just look at the, the numbers. Right? These two things in tandem will form an AC product. They're a product because they're the two things multiplied. What is just 6 times 10? 60. Right? From that, we can list pairs of factors. Here's a factors that make 60. All right? Because 60 happens to be a large number that is an even number, all right? there's going to be quite a few choices, but we want to make sure that we cover all of them. This is where rules of divisibility would come in handy. When you're listing the factors, do them in pairs and kind of stack them. All right? Start with always the absolute easiest thing in the world as far, as far as two pairs of factors are concerned. One and the number. So if this is 60, it would be 1 and 60 is one possibility. All right? This is an even. So if this is an even, it's divisible by 2, therefore 2 is a factor. 2 times something would make 60. What's half of 60? 30. The rule of divisibility for 3, which again would be here for reference 3, is a little bit more complicated. It's the sum of the digits. If you added these and you ended up with a number 6, and that number is divisible by 3. It certainly is. It is divisible. Then that means that the original number is also divisible by 3. It is certain. Now, what the number actually is, unless you have it memorized, you may have to go through the mechanics of figuring that out. 3 goes into 60. I couldn't do that again if I tried. 3 goes into 6, 2 times, and into 0 zero times. So it would be 20. Right. Sum of the digits. If the sum of the digits is divisible by the number 3, then the whole thing is definitely divisible by 3, which means that 3 is in fact the factor. In fact the factor. It's like, do you want the factor? <laughs> you know, I want the factor. <laughs> All right. Um, next one. For, I only happen to know, and this is a stupid reason, but it, it's practical, that 4 is going to work. You could try the rule of divisibility for 4, but you'd end up having to divide anyway in this case, all right, to establish what it is. All right. I memorized 
4 times 15 is 60. How did I do that? Because of time, all right? An hour, which is 60 minutes, is cut up into quarters of how many? 15, right? So that's just for the sake of familiarity. And don't feel bad about that either, all right? Five, all right? I know my five times tables up to 12 is in fact 60. That's really the reason. If you didn't know, you could try rule of divisibility for five. You'd say to yourself, this ends in a zero, therefore five definitely is divisible, therefore it's definitely a factor. But in order to establish the five, you'd have to sit here and actually do that. All right? Not a short division, or use a calculator in theory. All right? And then there's the thing it came from, six and 10. All right? The way that you know six is for certain is that if two and three work, then six has to work. That's the rule, the six. And then, again, it would help if you knew your multiplication tables of seven. Seven times nine is 63. That's pretty close, but it's overshooting it. All right. And um, eight times eight is 64, also overshooting it. All right. Anyhow, what you could say to yourself as you're going through this list is, first of all, go in numerical order as best you can. And you'll notice that the distance between these pairs gets narrower and narrower. Once you've gotten to a point that they're pretty much right on top of each other, 6 is as close to 10 as it could possibly get, all right, you're pretty much done. You've covered all bases. Anyhow, you need to establish these options in your mind. And I would never say keep it in your mind. Write it down. All right? Encourage your students to write things, all right? especially to write their thoughts. That's very important. All right? Anyhow, having done that, AC product pairs, right? product pairs, AC, we're now going to employ factoring by grouping. We're going to take this middle term and we're going to strategically cut it up into either a sum or a difference. This thing that's sitting here and this thing that's sitting here are just going to get carried down. Don't worry about the signs yet. Let's consider these choices. We can rule some of them out immediately. You might say, oh, this takes so much time. I don't feel, I, I sympathize really, but when you get good at it, you do it faster than you see me doing it. All right? If you added or subtracted one and 60, would you get 11 way off, right? So you go, mm -mm, eliminate that. If you added 2 and 30, would you get 11? No, they're way off, right? That'd be 32, and if you subtracted them, 28, right? When you get a little bit closer, then you should be a little bit more careful. If you added 3 and 20, you get 23. If you subtracted them, you get 17, not 11. Can't use that, all right? 4 plus 15, 19. If you subtracted them, that's 11. That's a possibility. Still check the others, because sometimes one is better than the other. Right? It's the sign combinations that will ultimately dictate what you use. All right? 5 and 12, that's uh, 17. All right? And if you subtract them, you get 6, so uh -uh, it's not going to work. 6 and 10 is 16. If you subtract them, you get 4. So the only choice is 4 and 15. Okay. So I'm going to put, let's see. I'll put 4 here, it doesn't really matter. Uh, if you like to put 15 here and 4 there, you probably don't have to worry about which is the one in the front. It's the signs that ultimately is the concern. All right, if the letter here is X, then that's the X that you must attach. Now we address the sign situation. Right. There's a side note. All right. These are the two questions that you have to ask yourself. All right. Um, am I going to do adding or am I going to do subtracting? This makes things bigger. This makes things smaller. Right. Right. This is 15 and 4. And this is the thing that they're going to create. Did something get smaller or did something get bigger? You got smaller than 15. So you would establish that you have to subtract in this case. All right. What causes subtraction? 
same size. Or one of each. One of each causes subtraction, for lack of a better phrase. Right. So that will force us to have one of each sign. All right. If you want the outcome, and the outcome would technically be 11, to be negative, the larger magnitude has to be the negative, and that has to be the positive. Okay. Now, at this point, having done that, we're now going to narrow our focus by paying attention to just two things simultaneously, rather than four, rather than three. This is the part that is known as factoring by grouping. now on the old, the older method, which is, okay, we're going to take this binomial and figure out what's in common. They have a letter in common, so it's just, uh, this was squared, this is x to the first. We want the lower power, somewhat ironically, so we're going to put that on the outside, x to the first. And they also have a common factor that is a number. If you listed factors of 6, it would be 1, 2, 3, and 6. If you listed factors of 15, it would be 1, 3, 5, and 15. Again, it is imperative that a person knows their multiplication tables by heart in order to go through this. Some dummy, all right, for lack of a nicer expression, truly, all right, some dummy in a position of authority who probably hated math, right, said, oh, I don't need to know that stuff. You screwed up, buddy, all right? Stop hobbling people by telling them not to do something, all right? Whoever you are, all right? All right, anyhow, everything is made of the factor of one. All right, but what's the best choice? In this case, it happens to be three. Three X, all right? Three X times, well, three times what would be six, firstly? Two, all right? X to the first times what would be X squared, another X, okay? Three times what is 15? 15, 15. Uh, pardon me, five. The x is already accounted for, so you don't need to do that here. You just do and need to make sure that the signs are correct. If this is a positive 3, and it is, all right, then this needs to be a negative 5 to make a negative 15. The multiplication division integer rules are different than the addition subtraction rules. These are the addition subtraction rules. Same signs causes adding, which basically makes things get bigger. One of each causes things to subtract, which makes things get smaller. But the sign of the answer matches the larger magnitude. I hate to squeeze this in here, and I hate to use that word magnitude rather than bigger digit, but I don't want to get in trouble by saying greater or less, because that's not correct. All right. Magnitude larger size digit, if you will, okay? Okay. Uh, again, we're going to fall back on the earlier method here. Uh, these do not have a letter in common, but they do have some number in common. So 1, 2, and 4 are the factors of 4. 1, 2, 5, and 10 are the factors of 10. Everything is made of the number 1, right, from the perspective of factors. All right, what's the best choice? 2, right? That's a GCF. So therefore, a 2 would sit here. And again, I'm going to borrow this plus. And then you figure it out backwards. 2 times what would be 4? Well, 2. All right. And it would need to have an x attached to it because we don't have one on the outside. 2 times what is negative 10? Minus 5. OK. Now, what you're hoping will happen did. All right. The joke that's sitting in here and in here, match. Therefore, it's going to factor this way. The match gets its own parentheses and the left outs, which is, again, my own bizarre way of talking about it. All right, the match is 2x minus 5, 
and the left outs, they're literally on the left and on the outside, is 3x plus 2. Okay, that's the fact of answer. Again, it's not impossible to go directly from this to this, but I'm trying to tinker with these four parts. If you know that a trinomial usually is a binomial set next to one of the binomial factors, you can, all right? But the larger these coefficients are, the more you're suffering needlessly in going through that process. I know that this is a little hairy, and it takes a level of comfort with multiplication tables and basic principles. That's why you must impress upon your children all right, your students, all right, when they're in third, fourth, fifth grade, don't talk them out of memorizing things, all right? It's very important, all right? If they have that down pat, they will have a level of comfort in the long run that will make their math life so much easier, okay? So the wrong that has been done to you, perhaps, don't propagate. Fix that problem. Finally, we'll get into solving now, because the fundamental skill of factoring is now out of the way, technically. The other methods for factoring, um, you probably don't need insofar as the, the material for section for a mat 114. If you happen to be in all 90, all right, that's another story. Right? Anyhow, I'm going to point at these. If you know this method, GCF, the most basic method, which you should always try first, all right? And you basically get this idea of AC prior pairs and factoring by grouping in tandem. You're pretty good, all right? If you know just these two things, you can go very far in factoring. The other stuff that follows it, these are models, all right? This is taking um, this model, this is a trinomial and a binomial and a binomial, and comparing that to whatever unique problem you're given. And you're saying, well, if something is a binomial, I'm gonna look here and here, you know? And maybe it would factor like this, or maybe it would be factoring like this, okay? Uh, Matt, 114 people, I don't think you have to worry about that. Okay. Now, um, there's this little sunbox here. All right. If you're going to solve, finally, to get out of my life marker. <laughs> You're terrible. Hopefully this is a little bit better. Reached up. Right. Solving. Uh, I think this may be the end of my blacks. I need a good black marker. Not a crappy one. Black markers are usually the best. Right? But if they break, you're in trouble. Alright, if you're gonna solve by factoring, right, here is the basic procedure. And you reserve this again, this is for quadratics, quadratic equations. That's a Q, I swear. Um, you want to, as a pr preliminary step, arrange, and if necessary, rearrange the equation to look like this. AX squared plus BX plus C equals zero. If something is not given to you in this shape, where it is obviously set equal to zero, all right? Purposely rearrange the parts via opposite operations, the earlier methods, so that it does look like this, okay? 
this is the key feature. All right, we want it set equal to zero. Officially, this is called the standard form of a quadratic equation, which is not to be confused with the standard form of a quadratic function. They look very similar, but because uh, they're both quadratic, but they use that term standard for something that actually is not arranged this way. All right. All right. Well, we're talking about equations, so this is legit. Okay. Rearrange it to resemble this if it is not that way. <clears throat> Step number one, realistically, assuming everything is swell, is to factor by whatever method that you need. All right, and then two, take advantage of something called the zero product rule. Shake it down again. Could be the board. All right, the zero product rule is the subscribing a label to something that you already know intuitively. What is zero times anything? What does that equal? Zero, right? What if I rearranged this so that it was anything in front? What would that be equal to? It would still be equal to zero. What is zero times itself? Zero, right? That's the zero product rule. And let me make sure that this is in the frame. I'll put that, tilt that just ever so slightly. Okay. And the only difference between this and what you might see in the examples that you get to do is that they will opt not for the multiplication x, right, but for something that is in fact in form, which means that there'll be parentheses wrapped around those things. If something is set equal to zero, then this has to be the case. One of these two things at least has to be equal to zero, or perhaps both of them simultaneously. And if we take advantage of that fundamental uh, morsel of logic, we could figure out what the letter actually is worth, right? what it equals, specific to the problem. We do have to get something to resemble factors first. We gotta get stuff basically into parentheses for going to, for, to, in the most superficial way of describing it. Okay, let me clean this up. That's the strategy from here on out, right? If um, we were instead to employ the quadratic formula we would basically start with this and we wouldn't need to go through this at all. We would just go straight for the formula from this shape. something that's pretty much good to go uh, to begin with. Right. Um, just dry already, please. I better get it up. Get an right back. And I'll throw out some deep duds here. These two stink.
let's say that you had something that was already factored, which would be great, right? If you didn't have to do the extra work. Um, let's say that you had x plus four sitting next to x minus three equal to zero. Now this is part of an equation, notice. So we're gonna use the zero product rule. The zero product rule is again, assuming that either one of these factors is equal to zero by itself, right? What I always do in this is kind of a, you know, a little idiosyncratic of me maybe, is to, you know, put a lightning bolt through here, <laughs> just to really separate them, and I'm like a flash, right? So you have x plus four equals zero here. Perhaps this factor equals this is what you're saying when you write that. Or perhaps this factor equals zero unto itself. Right? And what you end up doing is going through the usual process of solving. Now look what you have. It was, in theory, something that would have been quadratic to start with. It's already factored, so it's a little bit harder to see that, but it would have been quadratic. And we've transformed it into two linear factors. So when you're going through the process of solving these linear equations that come from this, we just have to employ opposite operations. Move the four from here to here. You know, move the three from here to here via opposite operations, the balancing act that is algebra. What is the opposite of adding four? Subtract four, subtract four, these cancel. And then you end up with x is equal to negative four. In one instance, that's what it could be. In this case, you add 3, and you add 3, and you have x is equal to 3. You can put a positive sign if you like. Right. Interestingly, right, it doesn't happen 100% of the time, but um, the symmetry, uh, I shouldn't say the symmetry, but the way it works is that if you have a linear equation, degree 1, you get one answer usually. All right. If you have a quadratic, you get two answers usually. If you have a cubic, you get three answers usually, right? There are some extenuating circumstances, but expect two solutions, okay, for a quadratic, right? It would also be a good habit to take these and plug them back in and make sure that they work, right? I can tell you just for the sake of time right now, they do. I better wash this again. I didn't do a good job with it. And I got a little too much soap suds on my board here. So I'm gonna stick with alcohol. Um, you know what? Uh, I'll spare myself the trouble and uh, try to squeeze in the next one underneath. Suppose now you had a problem like this, slightly more complicated. There's an added step or two. You have x squared minus x, 8x is equal to negative 15, okay? This, as it's given to you, does not resemble the model. The model has to be something in standard form, which would look like that, right? Standard form. There's a break on my wheels here. Step one. Okay, I'm gonna do that, leave that alone. Okay, so what does that mean? It means I'm gonna to have to employ a basic principle of opposite operations to manipulate this right off the bat. So I'm going to move the 15 from here to here. What is the opposite of subtracting 15? It ain't 15. It doesn't have space, but I'm just gonna you know, stick it under here for right now. Something minus itself is going to be zero, so we're getting closer to the model, all right? And then I should put it in descending order, which would be nice and neat. That's the good etiquette of math, if you will. So you have x squared minus 8x plus 15. That is a 15 I squared. Okay. Now look at what you have. You have a trinomial. It has, it's a little bit sloppily drawn. Put this 
these things a little bit closer together. Okay. But, all right, sloppy or not, it's separated by these pluses and minuses, so they are three terms. All right. And since there isn't a, a number other than a coefficient of one technically here, I would attempt, when I'm factoring this particular problem, the more um, basic way of doing it. All right. No special methods, just recognize what you got and what it usually goes to. A trinomial typically is a binomial sitting next to a binomial. I would only try to do this if you have nothing more complicated than x squared in the front. Right? If it's x squared, what's probably going to sit here and here? Probably x, right? If this is 15, then think of the factors of 15, 1 and 15 and 3 and 5. Of those choices, if you maybe add them or maybe subtract them, what probably is going to make 8? You would rule out 1 and 15, and you would say, yeah, it's probably going to be 5 and 3. Because when you multiply, they make 15, and when you add them, they make 8. Now there's the signs, right? We would need these things to add, right? Because that makes things bigger. Versus subtract, which makes things smaller. All right. What is the combination of signs that causes adding? Same signs cause things to add. It happens to be a negative, though, so they both have to be a negative. Okay? You should check it, all right? x times x is x squared. x times negative 5 is negative 5x. Negative 3 times negative x, pardon me, negative, pardon me, negative 3 times x is negative 3x, and negative 3 times negative 5 is positive 15. So, negative 5 and negative 3 is negative 8. It's cool, right? The last thing is to employ the zero product rule. The zero product rule, again, is just subscribing a name to something that you already know. That zero times anything is equal to zero. So if we assume for a second that this chunk, the x minus 3 chunk, maybe that equals 0, we can now solve a much tinier linear equation. And if we assume that this is true, that x minus 5 is equal to 0, we could simultaneously solve that equation. I'm just for the sake of space scribbling on what I overwrote. Solve this by adding 3 x is equal to 3. That's one answer. Solve this by adding 5. That's messy, but x is equal to 5. That's your other answer. You should plug them back into the original thing to check, but I'm not going to just for the sake of time. I'm at an hour 48 already. Now, um, let me see. Let's talk about um, the quadratic formula. And then I'll just remind you of some older stuff. to this overview of strategies, because the formula is written right on it. Right. This is the quadratic formula here. All right, x is equal to negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac, all sitting on top of 2a. The a, the b, and the c 
are the coefficients of your equation. You would, as before, have to get it in that shape, in the standard form, where the, all of the interesting stuff is on one side and zero is on the opposite side. It has to be set equal to zero in order to employ this method, just as it would be for this sake. All right, uh, rather factor. These other things, for you folks, again, in my 114, you're not responsible for these. All right, we're, we're working with the formula. The formula is for, really, for problems that don't factor, or that can't factor. They're not factorable, if that is even an English word, officially. All right, there's a phrase for that, too. Something that can't be factored into something more simplistic is referred to as prime. You've probably heard of prime numbers, right? Prime numbers famously are things like 2 and 3 and 5, where they only have two factors, one of themselves, right? If you attempted to factor the prime numbers, you'd get stuck with the prime numbers, basically, versus something like the number 4, which at least could be factored down into 2s, you know? Right. That would not be a prime number. This is what they call a composite number. Well, in a similar sense, when you have an algebraic expression that can't be factored into something simpler, smaller parts, if you will, they call it prime as well. Right. Nonetheless, we can get the answer, you know, an approximate at the very least. This is wet. Wow. Okay. And that is this formula, the quadratic formula. x is equal to negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac, all sitting on top of 2a. Okay. Now, in order to work something like this, again, you need something in standard form to begin with. So it has to resemble that, that model, ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. And if it's not given to you that way, you purposely rearrange the parts. Right. The other thing is, you're basically going to steal these coefficients with their sign and insert them in these respective locations. So it's just evaluating, really. There's no longer solving an equation if you're using a formula that is arranged this way already. All right. You are going to just play the game of arithmetic, which means you're going to follow the order of operations. And if you follow the order of operations, what that dictates is that you have to look at the inside of the square root before anything else. That's really where your focus should be. There's a name for that as well. There's a name for everything. <laughs> this is called the discriminant. The guts, anyhow. The inside is referred to as the discriminant. The reason it's called that is because it basically tells you whether you have real solutions or complex solutions. Complex solutions imply that there's an imaginary number somewhere. Right? We want real solutions for real life applications, right? But in theory, in math world, which is more broader, uh, open, more open-minded, if you will, all right, anything is possible. So there may be a complex solution. That's very sloppy. complex solution would involve a negative under a square root somehow. We'll deal with that later. Alright, here's an example of something um, that you could do right off the bat.
this would be kind of the worst case scenario. Um, suppose you were asked to solve, I probably should put this elsewhere. I'll move this up. Suppose you had to solve this example, 4x squared minus 8x equals uh, negative 1. Okay. Stare at it, compare it to the model for standard form. Does it conform to that shape exactly? Is it set equal to 0 already? No. So. I'm just going to manipulate it so it more closely resembles that shape. That means drag negative one over here. Right. Realistically, what is that going to accomplish? What's the sign going to be a one on the opposite side? It's going to be positive, and it's going to leave behind a zero here. I'm skipping steps a little bit. So, now it more closely resembles this. This is A, this is B, and this is C. That means I'm going to insert 4 in place of the A's. Good rule of thumb. Wrap your letter in a parenthesis, like a little pocket that you're going to insert. The reason that I would encourage you to do that is that when you get to say something like this A here, you have to be mindful that when it's being squared, the negative is also affected by that because it's filling this void. It's not going to be unaffected. So uh, I'm going to stick a 4 here and a 4 here because there's two A's. All right. The B, we're still sitting in two places. I'm going to make a little pocket, stick negative 8 in here, and then also here. There is coincidentally a negative in the formula. And then this C is just regular 1. I'm going to stick a 1 here. Okay. Because we've filled in all of the letters, the variables with numbers, it's no longer an algebra problem really, right? We're not going to be dragging anything over the equal sign, right? So it's purely arithmetic. We're going to simplify, right? And since you simplify, you play the game of arithmetic, you follow the order of operations as rigidly as you possibly can, which in this case means the inside guts of this square root, that's where your focus should be immediately. It's also convenient because it happens to be the discriminant, right? And the discriminant is something that's going to rule out whether you have imaginary numbers as an answer or whether they're exclusively real. You'll see when, when you get through the arithmetic here. All right. On the inside, we have this. Negative 8 squared minus 4 times 4 times 1. Of these choices, which is, involves multiplication, subtraction, and something that is an exponent, which is most important according to the order of operations? This much. So we have to square that first. Negative 8 times negative 8 is 64. Minus this junk. And even if it seems kind of silly, I'm going to not skip steps, okay, because I want to make sure that it's clear. Now I have the choice between subtraction and multiplication. Which is more important according to the order of operations? The multiplication. 4 times 4 times 1 is 16. That makes this 64 minus 16. What is just 64 minus 16? 48. Now bear in mind, this is all that has changed. We've reduced this to 48, and this is the junk that is still there, okay? Get one thing that is a good habit too for math, not to digress too much, is to, even if it seems cuckoo, all right, write out your thoughts like this. You're taking something long, ugly, and complicated, and you're whittling it down to just one thing, right? Don't ever follow the advice that maybe you have been, you know, berated as a student yourself. 
And I remember being told, ah, you need to do this, especially in sixth grade, you need to do this in your head, right? It is the worst advice anyone could ever give you, especially when you're learning math, right? Eventually, when you get to a level of confidence from comfort, comfort begets confidence, right? That you can do things in your head, right? But if you're learning something for the first time, you need to be able to show your thoughts so that somebody else can help you. Imagine that. <laughs> So, not to make a speech, all right? Set a good example for your students. Write as much as you can and encourage them to write, all right? You're, make, you're writing an algorithm is what this is called, right? It's very logical. It's a good mental exercise. Anyhow, simplify what you can now. The next, if you follow the order of operations again, what it would dictate is that you clean up the mess that is here. So, you might have a double negative here. It's just a plus or minus the square root of 48. And then down here, since I can't combine this stuff really yet, right? I'll just simplify this. I got eight, right? This is a pretty good answer, but it can be reduced. And if you can reduce something to smaller numbers, that is ideal. So what we're gonna do now, and incidentally, you may be wondering, why is this like so? It's plus or minus, Right? Because when you take a square root, a square root is asking you, what are the two identical factors that make this number underneath the radical symbol? What I should do is over-explain. So, humor me. First of all, this is referred to as a radical. The inside guts that you see in here is referred to as the radicand. Right? And a radical is a square root, right? In this case, at least, there's other types of radicals. All right, the question of square root is what are the two identical factors that make, that's a K, whatever the radicand is. All right, now under normal circumstances, if you had something like the square root of just four, is it's two times two, all right? But in theory, even if it was negative two times negative two, they would still make positive four, which is what this really is. That's what this uh, grouping of a plus sitting on top of a minus is indicating. It's, it's a, an abbreviation for, well, one of the answers could be positive, the other one could be negative. Meaning either this is positive two or this is negative two. Those are the two identical factors. They would both be either, either this together or this together. All right, side note, in the packet, there is this sheet, which is a lit, it's a reference of good things to memorize in the long run, specifically the square roots. These are called perfect squares, these numbers, 1, 4, 9, 16, 25. That literally comes from geometry, right? You know that if you were to find the area of a rectangle or a square, it's two numbers multiplied. Well, if it's a square, technically, they're exactly the same dimension. So they don't call them length and width, they call them side and side, right? A number times itself. 4 would be made from 2 times 2. 25 would be from 5 times 5. 64 would be from... Four, uh, pardon me, eight times eight, all right? It would be good to recognize these in the long run. Again, for the same reason, it would be good to know your multiplication tables. It helps you make predictions. Right? And it gives you a little more confidence. All right, anyhow, if you look at that list, one thing you're gonna notice is that this 48 is not in the list, all right? So here's what you do. You factor it. In order 
order to factor a radical, since this is this square root of 48 is not a perfect square, meaning that is the number 48 specifically, it's not going to escape the radical entirely. So what you can do is you can simplify. How do you simplify? By factoring the radical Ideally, this is what you do. You take that 48, or whatever is sitting there, and you break it up into a perfect square, and then maybe some leftover. The leftover is sometimes a, a, a composite number like 6, but it would be inconvenient to bother, that is, factoring it further. You wouldn't bother doing that. If you strategically choose the highest perfect square possible, you probably don't have to worry about that. Anyhow, we need to compile a list. And I put this incidentally as an overview. This is what this page is. When you factor radicals, ideally you want the highest perfect square, or if you're talking about a cube root, it would be the perfect cube, right? And then maybe a prime or composite number that would be inconvenient to break down further. Sixty-four and thirty-six are perfect squares. Forty-eight would be in between them, all right? But that's a whole number six and that's a whole number seven. And there's no whole number in between them. So in theory, the square root of forty-eight would be six point something. The fact of the matter is it's irrational and it goes on into infinity. It's non-terminating and non-repeating. There's no pattern. So the best that we can do is simplify it. All right? In order to decide what sits in this first factor, we have to compile some factors of 48, and there's gonna be quite a few, right? This is where rules of divisibility come in handy, right? One and 48 is one possibility. It's even, so two has to be a factor. So 2 times 24. Uh, the sum of the digits would be 12. That's 4 plus 8 would be 12. This is the rule of divisibility for 3. So if 12 is divisible by 3, then it's guaranteed that 48 is also. You would end up having to divide in order to calculate. It would be, in fact, 16. All right. Multiplication tables of 4. 4 times 12. All right. Um, what else? Uh, let's see. Five doesn't work because it doesn't end in a five or a zero, but six does because two and three work. So the last one I want to say is uh, six and eight. Right? And once you've gotten to a point where your factors are as close together without uh, overshooting each other, right, on top of each other, you've pretty much covered all of them. Now in this list of pairs, right, there will be perhaps more than one perfect square. Right? One is an example of a perfect square, and everything is made of the number one. But where's another one? Four is a perfect square, and there's in fact a third one as well, which again, look at this list here. Sixteen. You want the highest perfect square possible. If you take the square root of 16 and multiply it by the square root of whatever the balance would have to be, we figured it out as 3, right? this is basically almost done. Right? The advantage to doing this is that one of these is going to escape. Right? What is just the square root of 16 by itself? It's 4 times 4, so we just write 4. That means that the reduced version of this will look like so. A simplified incarnation of this will be the following. x is equal to positive 8 because of the double negative, plus or minus will never go away, the 4 that escaped, and then the square root of 3. 
and all of this will be sitting on top of 8. It goes up 2 times 4. All right. You could whittle this down, believe it or not, a little bit further, and if you can, you should try. You might be satisfied with it, and I wouldn't blame you, right? but um, always look. Right. Here's the thing. There's going, as in the case of all quadratics, going to be two answers, or well, mostly two answers. Right? The one that comes from doing this, that's one possibility. And then there's the one that comes from doing this. You might instinctively um, jump on your calculator and start plugging these numbers in. But even if you are going to do that, all right, all right, um, just realize that you could get away with using smaller figures than even these. All right. Because of the nature of this as having an even number here and uh, this uh, term also having an even coefficient, if you will, and then this number down here being even, you could actually reduce this. It has to cover all, these three have to be in that situation, basically. All right. If you look at it as two fractions, that's one fraction, and that's the second fraction. That means that you could write it this way. Eight sitting on top of eight plus four square root of three sitting on top of eight. And the other one would be very similar. It would be this x is equal to eight sitting on top of eight minus four square root of three sitting on top of eight. What's the difference? In this case, you're going to add that extra thing. In this case, you would subtract. Again, to complete this thought, the temptation might be to get onto your calculator to give you the square root, and I don't fool you for that, but just realize something. Because it's not a perfect square, because it's the square root of 3 that's left behind, right? it's never going to be a satisfying answer because it's going to be an infinitely stretching decimal. This is irrational, which means it is infinite, all right? and non-repeating, there's no pattern to it, all right? Non-terminating and non-repeating. I'm really squeaking it in here, okay? Which means that in order to combine it with something, you're gonna end up having to round. And that's bad news if you were doing engin if you were in engineering or if you were in science. We don't like to round, all right? So math people uh, basically leave things inside the radical in their reduced, as simplified as possible form, and that's what three is. So believe it or not, it's not a satisfying answer because we want a decimal, I, I sympathize. It's a better answer insofar as square root of three is concerned. It's 1.7 something, whatever, into infinity, right? Anyhow, the rest of it you could reduce, right? What's eight divided by eight? One. If you treated this, and it is in fact a form, so you can get away with doing this, as a fraction 4 over 8, what's 4 over 8 reduced? A half. So this would be square root of 3 sitting on top of 2. That would be the most simplified incarnation of this answer. And this one, same thing. x would be 8 divided by 8 is 1, and this would give you minus a half which in its least com complex way of writing it would be like that. Okay. So you get two answers. All right. In the rare occasion that you end up with a negative, let me just share this information with you. I don't think you folks in Math 114 are going to have to worry about it, but it is worthy of consideration. Here's the, um, let me 
is uh, how, how shall I say this? Uh, how we will write something that ends up being imaginary. Remember what I was saying before. Right? The guts of this is referred to as the discriminant. Right? And again, it basically would indicate it's a terrible hole too. This indicates whether it's going to be entirely real or if it's going to be complex. Complex implies that there's an imaginary number. Imaginary. Square root of a negative. If you had a problem where you ended up with something like this, doing this work, if you ended up with this, because this is under a square root, of course, uh, a negative number like, let's just say, 4, all right? Since square root asks you, what are the identical factors? It's kind of an amped up version of division, right? In the same way that squaring is a more amped up version of multiplication, in this case, the factors would have to be identical in terms of their digits, but also their signs. The digits would definitely be 2 in order to produce a 4, but there is no combination of signs that's going to give you a negative that are identical. One of them would be negative and one of them would be positive. Therefore, we can't answer the question. It's imaginary. All right? So what we do is we acknowledge that it's imaginary by writing this instead. Instead of having the square root of negative 4, we go, it's imaginary. And they signify that by sticking an i on the outside of the square root. And if this is something that is a perfect square, the 4 is, then it would go one step further and you would put a 2i. Right? If you had a problem like this, square root of negative 3, then there's nothing you could, it doesn't have identical factors to begin with. Right, so you're stuck with square root of negative 3, but you could at least acknowledge that it's imaginary by writing it that way. Once you stick the i on the outside, uh, you could remove the negative sign. And believe it or not, that's it. You're done with it. Right? It'll be plus or minus whatever is adjacent to it. All right? That's a more theoretical math, though. And you don't really have to worry about, uh, unless maybe you're in break calculus, and even then that's kind of iffy, all right? Or um, in calculus and beyond, okay? If anyone is here from 090, uh, just to review some of this stuff, this is where we would part ways. If you're interested, I'm going to go over a word problem that's for my Matt, uh, Matt 114 people, all right? Okay, Matt 114, folks. Here's an example of a word problem that would involve a quadratic. So let's look at that. Um, I took the liberty of typing this, so if you just have this printed out, all right, we can do this problem. All right? And since it comes from the section of how to solve quadratics, chances are it's going to be a quadratic. But there are telltale signs. All right, too. I purposely wrote this in color, and I tried to highlight, by changing the color of the font, the pertinent information. Right? When you make something for your students, you know, um, especially little kids, I would do that. It, it's time consuming and sometimes you just don't have the ink or you don't have the time. All right? But uh, ideally, all right, you would want to do that to make it as crystal clear and easy for them to read as possible. All right? Dana and her husband recently installed, yeah, I'll stand here, um, an, an in-ground rectangular swimming pool measuring 30 feet by 40 feet. Okay? 
They want to add a brick border of uniform width around the wall sides of the pool. How wide can the brick border be, right, if they purchased enough brick to cover an area of just 296 square feet? Right. Rephrasing it a little bit in the process there. Whenever you hear, this is a strategy for dealing with word problems. Whenever you hear something referred to a shape, you know, immediately draw, all right? That's a good habit, right? If the word problem is referring to a shape, draw the shape. The pool is apparently a rectangle. So attempt to draw, pardon me, a rectangle. Okay. And then, um, I don't know, have fun with it, right? Here's some waves. <laughs> And here's the dimensions, 40 times 30. And here's a shark, all right, just in case, or some piranha or whatever, right? Makes it more fun, all right? And this is the pool, all right? Yay. Um, if I were really smart, what I would do is I would um, label the dimensions as 30 and 30 and 40 and 40, because that's what the dimensions are quoted as being, all right? What the folks in this problem are asking is for, well, the design is basically to have a brick patio that stretches all the way around this pool that, since it has to be uniform, means that the distance from here to here and the distance from here to here and there to there and there to there and all the way around it is all even. It's like I would draw it poorly, all right, um, you get the idea. This thickness, if you will, of this uh, patio is going to be uniform all the way around it. Now, what you might realize is that basically it's one rectangle inside another. And when you recognize that, right, that will help you start to build a skeleton and then flesh it out. Right. That's basically what you do when you're when you're trying to solve a word problem. The the task of solving a word problem is basically um, building an equation, or well, sometimes it's just an expression. You know, but in our case, it's going to be an equation. From there, sometimes say it purposely vague, and sometimes just pull the writ uh, phrasing. Right. So there's the other thing. I, I think I said this to you last time we talked about word problems. Hmm. Not all textbooks are created equal. Sometimes the person who wrote you a word problem is a bastard, <laughs> right? So take that into consideration and you as the, the teacher, take their, their vomit and rephrase it so that it's easier for somebody else to understand, all right? Okay? So what do we have? One tangle in, uh, rectangle inside of another, essentially, is what's being talked about here, all right? And they did quote an area, all right? They, they mentioned one area and then another, but let, let me do this first, all right? There's going to be a larger rectangle area, and I'm going to just kind of lock that into its own little pocket there, and simultaneously, a smaller, right, rectangle area. If I were a little bit more strategic, I would keep this kind of uniform in color, right? Since this is a pool, right, and I did draw some waves in here, let's refer to this, in, well, I'll just sort of imply this by being blue, right? And again, if I were a little bit more strategic, I'll make this red. We have these two things, these two areas, really. All right. If you're an artist, right, 
then you might already have some inkling about what's next. Right? We've identified that there's a small rectangle and a large rectangle, and that means that there's a smaller area and a larger area. But if one is inside the other, one is superimposed upon the other, what that means is that one obscuring the other is going to basically cancel out. Right? If one thing is sitting on top of the other, it's going to cancel out uh, part of the thing behind it. All right? I'm kind of drawing a crosshair pattern here because I'm trying to show you that that's what's really the relevant area. All right? Out of the bigger border that is in red, the part that is crosshashed is the patio in brick. And it kind of looks like brick, I suppose, if you did it in a nice pattern. All right. In order to basically superimpose one rectangle on top of another and just leave behind the patio, what that they are talking about, all right, which operation is kind of implied without explicitly saying it? When one is sitting on top of the other and some of it goes away, when something gets smaller, which operation are we talking about out of your four choices? Multiplying, uh, dividing, adding, or subtracting. What makes things smaller to start with, more basically, is subtraction. Right? The larger area minus the smaller area. Right? Now, to complete this thought, all right. Remember, they did say there's some limitation here, and I'll point to it here. How wide will they make the patio, all right, the brick border they're calling it, all right, if they only bought so many bricks as to cover this 296 square feet? Square feet all right, is another little tell. When you hear square feet, all right, that is implying an area. The difference, these two things in tandem, their difference is this brick patio that goes around this thing. What does it have to equal? It has to equal the amount of bricks that they have to work with because they are cheap. You know, well, they're being strategic is really what it is. It has to equal 296. All right. Anyhow, you could see that I'm starting out uh, kind of feeling around in the dark a little bit. Right? And I'm being more verbal than I am being mathematic. Right? But I'm, that's what you are. You're a detective when you're, you're solving a word problem, you're taking their verbal um, stuff and you're trying to symbolize it as concisely as possible. So the point of this is don't feel bad if you start out being more verbal and less symbolic. All right? You're going to whittle it down. All right? That's part of the mental exercise and the whole point of it anyway. All right, so we have a larger area and we have a smaller area. The smaller area we can figure out pretty much like this because we know the dimensions of this pool. So I'll just erase the, the funny nonsense here and look at the pool exclusively. This is a 40 by 30 rectangle. What is its area? That means that it's what? That it's 30 this way from here to here. And that it's 40, although it's exaggerated, 40 this way. How do you calculate the area of a rectangle? The area of a rectangle is, they take for granted that you know this, area is equal to the length times the width. So if you know the dimensions are 40 by 30, what is 40 times 30? 40 times 30 is 4 times 3 is 12, and then there's two zeros. It's 1,200, right? And if you want to include the unit, feet squared. A lot of times I just write it like that. Right? Same thing here. Right? Or you could put S cubed for square, right? This one is the larger rectangle. We can calculate the area of that as well, and we're going to need to, but it's more obscure because they didn't give us the dimensions. They just simply implied that it's going to be the same all the way around. All right. So here's how we would figure that out. I'm going to need to erase a little bit. We 
we don't know what the dimension is from here, the edge of this blue uh, pool to the edge of this red rectangle here. So if we don't know what something is, often what we choose is a letter to represent the unknown, X, all right? The same exact situation would exist if we examined the, the, the distance from this corner to the edge here. It is also, since it's uniform the whole way around, X there and X there. Thickness of X, thickness of X, thickness of X, all the way up to this corner here, and again, turn in that corner, X, thickness is the same, whatever it is, still X, turn the corner, still X, thickness is the same, is the same as uniform, all the way here. Right. Now, it's very sloppily drawn, unfortunately, but this is meant to illustrate a uniform border. And since we don't know what it is, we're just calling it x, right? What we can do is write an algebraic expression. We don't get the satisfaction, unfortunately, of knowing any numbers other than what is here, and it's actually sufficient, right? If you wanted to get the distance total from here through here down to there, all right, it's going to incorporate that mysterious thickness from here to here, the length that we do know of the inside of this uh, swimming pool, and then this additional thickness here. All right, let's try to make an algebraic expression to get this dimension that has to be exactly the same length adding together these three pieces. Right. I'm just basically taking this, if you will, and stretching it back to here to go, that's the side dimension of the red rectangle. It would be x plus 30 plus x again, right, to get one dimension. Let's call this a length. Yeah. What's a more concise way of saying x plus x? 2x plus 30. Maybe width would be more appropriate, it depends. I'm just gonna call that w. All right. Simultaneously, I have to figure out this dimension this way, and it's the same process, it's just using a different number. All right. We know that the thickness, at least this far from here to here, is x, all right? And then from here to here to continue would be 40, apparently. And then it picks up again x. So we would start with that, all right? What's a more concise way of writing x plus x? L is equal to 2x plus 40. All right, this is very sloppily written, I apologize. But let me circle the pertinent information. We need to figure out the area of the larger rectangle for the purpose of subtracting. But in order to get through this, all right, we need this dimension, which we've just determined, this way. And this dimension, which we've just determined that runs this way. All right, this is W for all intents and purposes, this is L. Those two things multiplied together. Instead of just 40 times 30, we have an algebraic expression times an algebraic expression. But it will give us the area that is the larger area. All right, I need the board space. So since we have a strategy now, I'm going to erase some stuff. So 
So I'm gonna put that there. Blue is this a nice one? No. If this is a binomial essentially, and this is a second binomial, we're gonna end up having to foil this. Right. Or we could try point A squares if you like. Right. Anyhow, it's gonna be 2x plus 30 times 2x plus 40 in order to calculate an area of a rectangle. We're just using these dimensions instead of just the regular numbers because that's sufficient only for the small square rectangle. Okay, so 2 times 2 is 4. X times X abbreviated is X squared. 2 times 4 is 8 with a 0 attached to it is 80 with an X attached to it and it's positive. 3 times 2 is 6 with a 0 attached to it and an X is also positive. And 3 times 4 is again 12, with two zeros, is 1,200. We should try to shrink whatever we can. The like terms in the middle usually are combinable. That's a phrase. 80 plus 60 is 140 x, and then this is 1,200. Okay, that's what we're going to put here. work better than the other way, so I'm thinking. <laughs> so, 4x squared plus 140x plus 100, uh, 1200 is going to be in here. This equation, which, again, felt around the dog but got to the place, is quadratic because it has a 2 exponent has these dimensions x, which I just sort of arbitrarily decided is the thickness of the border. That's what the question is asking about. What the x is essentially, what's the thickness of this border? So what we just need to do now is simplify this one side of this equation, and then maybe attempt to factor use zero product rule, or maybe the quadratic formula to figure out what x is eventually. So, I'm going to put it here. Right, that was a dud too. I have, for the sake of space, this larger area expressed algebraically and then adjacent to it this smaller area which is definitely 1200 and then there's the the amount of brick area that they have to be uh, um, what's the word frugal right? <laughs> if I got rid of these parentheses and I distributed this negative here, I end up with two terms which are remarkably similar. These two. One is a positive, one is a negative. So for our own uh, benefit, they actually cancel out entirely. Right. And now we have this. We have just 4x squared plus 140x, and then it's equal to 296 on the opposite side. You can see that we're slowly but surely whittling this down to um, the bare essential. That's the job of math, if I may make a speech again. All right, it's not to make things nebulous, it's to demystify something. Right. Anyone that has uh, somehow uh, taken joy, all right, and making something cloudy, right? especially in the position of teacher, is a failure as a teacher. Right? Your job is to demystify, not make things worse. All right, anyhow, you have a quadratic, you have one term here. 
I'm going to move this over. So if this is a positive 296 to justify moving it, I'm going to subtract it. I don't have a like term, but I can cancel this out and I'll be left with zero. That leaves me with 4x squared plus 140 minus 296. Now, you could um, attempt to plug these numbers into the quadratic formula because it would work, but they're kind of large. Right? So you might try factoring it instead, right? and in which case, uh, not to belabor the point, but um, if you're going to go with any method of factoring, all right, you go with the most basic method first. All right, which again I'm going to point to here, the GCF method. Try to figure out a common element that you're going to extract from all the others and write it on the outside of a parenthesis and leave some leftovers on the inside. We will always attempt to do that first and only when that fails, move on to more sophisticated techniques. So, um, you can see if you analyze these numbers, they're all even. So you could right off the bat say, yes, it's, it's two. That is the common element that I should put here. But there might be a better choice, right? Um, the smallest of these is the number four. What would be practical and strategic would be to see if four is a factor of 140 and if four is a factor of 296, right? The rule of divisibility for four is if the last two digits is divisible by four, the whole thing is. So if you have a, a triple digit number or wider, it will be good to apply that, all right? What it actually is, aside from four, in each of these cases, you'd end up having to do the division anyway. 96 is divisible by four, all right? 40 is certainly divisible by four. So the GCF is actually four itself. So I'm going to put that here. They don't have a letter in common, so I can't go any further with that. 4 times x squared would produce this first term. 4 times something, I have to establish what it is, it's an x, all right, um, is 140. So I'm going to have to do the brute force division here to figure out what it is. Definitely invest in some new markets. All right. 4 goes into 14 roughly 3 times, which is 12, and the difference is 2. And 4 goes into 20 exactly 5 times. So it's a 35, apparently. Okay. Same thing. 96, if you tested it, it would be divisible by 4, meaning it would, there would be no remainder. So the whole thing, 296, you're stuck with basically dividing by 4 to figure it out. Right. 4 goes into 29 roughly. 7 times, which is 28, the difference is 1, this is a short division. 4 goes into 16 exactly 4 times, which is 16, so it's 74, minus 74. Okay, now if you want to do yourself a favor, realize that you have something that is partially factored, but the, uh, the factor here, you can go further with this, but the factor here is just a regular number. You could dismiss this automatically if you wanted to. You can divide by four here, and into zero, you still get zero, and you get something that's equivalent. What I'm gonna do before I jump the gun is try to go one step further. There's still technically this four here for now, for now, all right? We'll try to go about it the most basic way, you know, the intuitive way. If this is x squared, what is probably sitting here and here? Probably x. The factors of 74 are not so easy. You'd have to go through a rules of divisibility once again to decide what they all are. All right. It would be firstly one and 74. It's even, so it's gotta be two and something else. All right. Brute force divide. 74 divided by two, two goes into this three times with one left over is 37. All right. And there might be others. Some of the digits is 11, that doesn't work with three. Therefore, 6 will not work because both 2 and 3 have to. It doesn't end in a 0 or a 5, so it doesn't work with 5. All right, 7 times 11 is 77. That's too much. 8 times 9 is 72. That's too much. It's pretty much this, these two choices. 
if you maybe added or subtracted, would one of these also make 35? It would in fact be these two, right? You'd have to subtract in that case. So you're gonna put 37 here and two here and make sure that the signs work. They're gonna shrink, all right, to go to 35. So subtraction causes that. What combination of signs causes subtraction? One of each sign. So this will be, uh, has to be positive for the larger one to make a positive result, and minus two. Okay, almost done. This is factored. Again, if you want to, you can divide out four here, divide out four here, and the fours cancel, and then you're left with this. minus 2 and x plus 37 is equal to 0. Now I apply the zero product rule, which says that maybe this is 0, maybe this is 0. Go through the motions, move 2 by adding, you get x is equal to 2. Move this, minus 37, x is equal to negative 37. These in math world are both theoretically possible, right? But remember what this is supposed to be representing, real life, and in real life, feet, because it's um, so many square feet, this is gonna be feet here, and this in theory would be feet here. How you would decide which one of these is correct in real life applications? There are no negatives in real life. There are no negative lengths, all right, or widths. All right, so that's why you would rule that out. This makes more reasonable sense anyway, all right? Two feet is how wide the brick patio would be all the way around the pool, okay? So that's it, all right? This was section 6-9. If you happen to be here for section 090, that's a different class. All right, it's a, just a summary of the quadratic uh, equations. Okay, try to print this. All right, between now and uh, probably Tuesday night, all right, try to do section six nine, all right, in uh, my lab. Uh, this is for my Mac 114 people. Okay, all right, thank you guys. Have a good weekend, and I'll see you on Monday. All right, Matt 114. All right, take care.